morning. I think this is working to go to Facebook as well as to our Zoom. Uh, my apologies for us getting started a little bit late, uh, but apparently Zoom and Facebook decided to start talking to each other in new ways in the two weeks since I have done this. It's lovely to have you on for worship today, however it is that you're joining us, whether you're in our Zoom room whether you are on Facebook or whether you are watching this later on YouTube or our website. I am so glad that you choose to worship with us today. A few announcements, of course. Uh, you'll have noticed that we're back to 1130 for our virtual service. That will stay that way for the next little while and it will be 1130 every week on Zoom, Facebook, all of that uh, for virtual and the alternating services at 930 will start or have started this morning. So we were at La Flash this morning. Next Sunday at 930 we will be at Limerick and then we'll move back and forth as is the case. But you can always find us if you get confused and you're not sure where we are, you can check out our website, uh, you can give me a call or just join us at 11.30 online. We are always here uh, virtually at 11.30. Uh, Limerick Trinity Council will meet on the 5th of May at 7 o'clock on Zoom. If you are on council or are just interested in some of the topics being discussed, please give us a call or join us on that day. Um, in the, the list of topics what went out in the bulletin and announcements and Thursday thoughts this week. Trivia night is tomorrow. We are going to Ontario in a much safer way than it would be if we were flying there. We will be joining Westminster United Church for our trivia. It is at six o'clock Saskatchewan time. So feel free to grab your supper and come and eat and play at the same time. It is 20 random questions. We have a lot of fun. So please come and join us. I think that's all the announcements that I have, with the exception, of course, of our music license number. Uh, we have that that um, announcement every week, it seems. And so our license number is A609189. And our music is reproduced with permission um, under that license. And Sherry Sproul is the one who played for us this morning. We begin our worship as we always do by acknowledging the territory. We remember today the land on which we worship. It has been the traditional land of the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, Cree, Soto, and Métis peoples for generations. As people of the United Church, we remember and repent of the harm that has been done to our Indigenous kindred, and we commit to living in a relationship built on love and care for all. Our call to worship this morning was written by Catherine Hawker and was written on Walker's Outside the Box website. I like the idea of outside the box. Come to hear the word. Come to do the word. Come to experience comfort. Come to experience challenge. Come to find cost. Come to find joy. Come to find humanity and come to find community. Come to find church. Come to find God. Come, let us worship. So we light our Christ candle today, remembering that God is present with us in all our lives, not only in this time of worship, but wherever we are and whatever we do. And so we light it to see God's presence in this place. Our 
Our prayer of approach this morning is from the Revised Common Lectionary Prayers. I invite you to pray with me aloud as you feel comfortable keeping yourselves muted, but hearing your voice and mine and imagining all the others. Let us pray. Creator of the universe, you made the world in beauty and restore all things in glory through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray that wherever your image is still disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war, and greed, the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love, and peace to the glory of your name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number six in, vo in more voices. That's our spiral bound book, if you have it. It's called Holy Spirit, Come Into Our Lives. And I invite you to kind of wiggle and move. It's got a little bit of a, a fun beat to it. So I invite you to sing with me. scripture reading today is from the book of Acts. It starts at uh, verse 7 of chapter 6 and then goes through some of chapter 7. The word of God continued to spread. 
The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedman, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Sicilia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seizing him and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And here's my paraphrase of what he says in the next 49 verses, because I figured you didn't want to hear them totally read and they didn't fit in the bulletin. Stephen goes on to tell the story of God at work in the world and in the lives of our ancestors. He tells the good, the bad, and the ugly before he ends with these words. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed toward, together towards him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. When they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've often talked about how when I work with children and, and with youth, I use often use something called wondering questions. And one of the my favorite wondering questions to use is I, I wonder where you see yourself in the story. It's always an interesting one to, to get the kids' reactions on. And so I wonder who are you in this story? Who are we in this story? How are, who are we as, as individuals, as a church, as a community? And when I say church, I mean, it, that could be a local congregation. You could take that to mean the National United Church of Canada or Christianity, the Christian church as a whole. Who are we in this story? As I see it, there are three options for answers to that question. We are maybe Stephen, who is being put to death, those who are throwing stones, or a young man named Paul, who, or Saul, who we know better as Paul, who holds the coats. And we may be, and probably are, all three at some point or another, but I wonder when you listen to this story, where do you see yourself? 
I like to say that we are Stephen, not in the sense that we are getting martyred. I don't want that for any of us, but in the sense of being full of the Holy Spirit and speaking in truth and honesty. But honestly, I'm not so sure that we always are. Sometimes, yes, sometimes we do a really good job of understanding God's desires for the world and work hard to make that happen. But too often, we don't. Too often, we pay lip service to the issue of the day, whatever that might be, without doing any real work to align ourselves with God and God's life in this world. We want to be a prophetic voice, but to be a prophet is a difficult thing. It's a little bit frightening because it might get you stoned. And so we turn aside. We turn aside from the call of God and find ourselves instead either throwing stones or holding coats. The church the church has thrown a lot of stones over the years, and we continue to do so today. Sometimes that's been the worldwide Christian church, and sometimes the United Church of Canada specifically. Sometimes we have realized and repented of that, and sometimes we continue to throw the stones. For example, I think about the ways in which the, uh, the church has interacted and continues to interact with our Indigenous siblings and those are kindred in the LGBTQIA community. We have often thrown big stones, more like boulders, it seems, when we have been interacting with these other children of God in these particular groups. And it's understandable that because of that, we want to look back and say, well, we've changed. And in many ways we have, but in other ways we have simply exchanged the boulders for smaller stones that hurt just as much and often go unseen. Many United Church congregations, our own included, begin worship each week by acknowledging the territory. You heard us do that this morning. But how many go beyond that? How welcome would an ind Indigenous member of the community be feel if they came to worship in our church, in United Churches across the country? Is the acknowledging the territory simply an easy thing to do that we don't actually follow up on? What have we done to truly further the work of reconciliation in our own little corner of the world? The United Church of Canada, if you ask anybody on the street, you will hear that we are well known for being on the forefront of the fight for LGBTQ rights. And so I wonder if that's what we're known for, then how come every single one of our congregations is not affirming? Affirming being the designation that means that you've actually put the intentional work into knowing who you are and being welcoming and inclusive of all people, not just saying, oh yeah, everybody's welcome to come to church. So I wonder why, why isn't every congregation of the United Church of Canada have the designation of affirming? Is it because we um, are just happy that, um, you know, the national church is, uh, is welcoming and we don't have to do anything with it on our local front? Is it because it's too much work? Is it because we figure everyone already knows that we're affirming and that we're welcoming to all? What, what are the reasons for it? What stones of exclusion and prejudice do we continue to throw, not just on these two groups, but specifically today, what stones of exclusion and prejudice do we continue to throw 
even if we've put down the boulders of our past. So question to think about what, how we are the ones to throw stones, but perhaps even more harmful than that is that when, when we're the ones who are holding the coats, you know, it, it is not a good thing to be the thrower of stones, but to be the one watching and doing nothing is just as bad. You've probably heard the maxim that says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. That's Paul in this story. So often it's us as well. And we have all sorts of excuses. We give ourselves all sorts of outs. We say that's an internal matter, or I'm not a member of take your pick of minority groups. I'm not a member of that group, so I don't think it's my place to speak on that topic. Or we say, I believe in everyone's right to make up their own mind. Or I don't want to rock the boat. Or, well, Jesus wouldn't want me to get too political. Or it's just not the right time. All of those sound good on the surface, but they don't actually work if we look at them a bit deeper and we find that they are just excuses. Yes. Absolutely, 100%. Those of us who are not in the minority should never presume to speak for or center ourselves when talking about a group of which we are not a part. It's incredibly important to listen to the voices of those who have experienced oppression. But sometimes, sometimes evil needs to be called out and you're the only one around to do it. Sometimes being an ally means educating ourselves and others so that those who live in that reality are not always expected to bear the burden of education. Sometimes staying silent is not an option. And yes, the ideal may be a day of calm sailing, but the boat is already rocking in the storm and sometimes Jesus calls us to not only rock the boat, but get out of it altogether so that we can be like him and help to calm that storm. And yes, I know that I am conflating the two of the storm stories in the Bible. Just work with me here. Because in case you didn't know it already, Jesus was extremely political. He wasn't partisan. He wouldn't tell you who to vote for, but he was political to the nth degree and would tell you what you should be thinking about and acting on in the terms of politics. And so he wants us to follow in his footsteps. And if we're going to do that, then staying silent is not an option. So I ask again, who are you? Who are we in this story? Who do we want to be? And how do we get there? And perhaps more importantly than how we get there and who we want to be, who are the voices of the prophets of our time and place that we are actively trying to silence or just simply ignoring? Because if the story of Stephen teaches us nothing else, it is this, that the story of God does not go off course or does not end when we go off course and kill the prophets. God's life and love and justice will always break forth. But it's our job to not go off course and kill the prophets. It is our job to recognize and come alongside working together for the life of all God's creation. Our world is at a tipping point in so many ways. We are finally starting to acknowledge the long ignored crisis of racism, both individually and systemically. We are realizing that the way in which we have interacted with the natural world and considered it our divine right is not only not sustainable, 
but is actually not the will of God. This pandemic has shown us that there is injustice in our economic systems and that those who have been deemed essential in this time are often deemed expendable once their work is done. And so I want to hear from you. What prophets should we be hearing from in our church? What should we learn in study and in worship so that we can better join hands with God? How can our community of faith come together to shape our corner of the world in the image God imagines? I invite you to think about that individually, to chat with one another, and then to give me a call or send me an email in the next couple of weeks and let me know what you've been thinking about. I really do want to hear what you're thinking. And it's easy sometimes to, to feel overwhelmed or underprepared by the amount of suffering in the world. We know that sometimes we will pick up stones. Sometimes we will stand passively by and watch the coats of those who throw the rocks. We know that we will not always get it right, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to try. As the rabbi Pirkei Avot said in paraphrasing, paraphrasing the Mishnah and the Talmud, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Friends, we are called by God, guided by Christ, and filled with the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and join hands with one another, with God, and with prophets near and far, and to go forward in the spirit of justice and love to bring about a world in which all God's creation can sing. Amen. As people of the United Church of Canada, we proclaim our faith with the words of a new creed. So I invite you to say these words aloud with me now. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone, thanks be to God. Every day of our lives, we make choices of how we live, what we do, what we say, what we give to God. And so today in this time, we intentionally think about what it is that we offer, our time, our talents, our treasure, whether that's a monetary offering to one of our churches or to other places in which God's life is lived out in this world, whether it is an offering of time or talent, whatever it is that we are able to offer to God, we give it now as we sing together our offertory hymn. <laughs> Thank you. 
Our prayers to the people today was written by the Reverend Dr. Derek Browning. I invite you to keep in your hearts all those who are named in our bulletin, those who you know in our church community and in our communities at large, but also those who you've maybe heard about on the news or in the world. Let us pray. God of grace and light, found with, within and out with the structures of humanity. You cannot be contained, but on occasion choose to dwell in hearts and homes. Glance lightly upon the hearts and homes dear to us, the people and places where we seek blessing. Build up our homes where the happy may find peace. The sad may find comfort, the hungry may find food, the weary may find rest. Build up the places where we work, where the honest may find reward, the dedicated may find delight, the imaginative may find new horizons. Build up our community where the isolated may find friendship, the marginalized may find welcome, the unloved may find acceptance. Build up our nation, loving God, and bless those entrusted with the care of our society's fabric. May they use their skills, their calling, to fashion communities of grace and understanding where generosity of heart and mind and soul may be not only the gilding of our daily life, but its very core. Build up the church, redeeming God, so that all your children may find their place, unique and special, chosen and essential to the living edifice of grace where by your grace, each one might know their value in, their, in your economy and their significance in your eyes. Help us all this day to be living stones and not dead weights, dreaming dreams and living gloriously the joy and kindliness of a faith that edifies everything that life should be. In the name of our Savior, our cornerstone, we pray his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Our final hymn today is another More Voices. It's number 76, If I Have Been the Source of Pain.
friends go from this time and place of worship choosing not to throw rocks or hold coats but like Stephen to boldly share the vision of God and as you go, may you go with the blessing and the love of God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Jesus, who is our elder brother, and the Holy Spirit of life within you this day and evermore. Amen.